This Zoom replay video was originally streamed summer 2020 and is a part of the Tibet House U.S. Menla online offerings. To learn more about upcoming retreats in person and online, please visit our website at menla.org. Good. Well, it's lovely to be with everyone. We might have some more people coming in as we go along and just really glad to be able to share on this topic with you all. It does, as you said, Wyatt, it does feel really timely. You know, what does it mean to integrate freedom and, and have a balanced spiritual life in especially the, the times that we're living and, and the stress that many of us are under. So it does feel like a good time while the, it wasn't planned that way. So I want to take a minute first and sit. So just find yourself comfortable wherever you are. Uh, feel free to adjust your position so you feel supported uh, by your seat, both alert and relaxed. You can allow your eyes to gently close or you can keep them open. Begin by that simple old practice of noticing the breath. Allowing yourself to arrive here. Following in particular the exhalation. The inhale comes naturally and then ride the breath out, ride the exhalation out. If it feels right, lean in particular back into the back body. It might even just be a half an inch of an adjustment you make. Can you feel the body sensation, the entire back side of the body? With each successive exhalation. So remain connected with the whole back side of the body and then simultaneously feel the heart in the front side of the body. Perhaps with the inhale, feeling the heart, whole front side, exhaling back of the body, leaning back a little bit. So allow your breath to flow, inhaling to the heart in the front side, exhaling to the back. Just following the flow of your own breath in and out. And on your next exhalation, sensing both front side, back side at the same time. Mind can't be easily on two objects at once. So let go of thinking or imagining and simply the felt sense front, back, exhalation. Perhaps there is a sense of a spaciousness or vastness of your own presence, of your own being. Within that, welcoming any contraction, constrictions, tensions, all of it, welcome to be here. As the mind relaxes from holding front and back, can it also just relax from the day? So kind of a, a dropping down and in and out. Sensing the palms of both hands, perhaps squeezing the palms of both hands and setting them on your thighs, just feeling contact with your own body. 
feet somewhere near or on the floor. And then gently reorient your attention. So eyes begin to open if they're closed. Lift them all the way up the ceiling. And kind of do a big circle of the room, not looking at the screen yet. Just circling with the eyes, taking in the whole room, feeling again back into the back body. And then inhaling to the heart, coming back to the screen if it feels right. And at any time, if you would like to take your attention from the screen and just take in your surroundings, rest with your eyes closed, um, we can't see you. So you do what feels right for you. And we'll have time throughout this process where I'll be asking you questions in the chat box. And then also we'll have time for Q&A. And when you ask a question, we'll be able to hear you, but we won't be able to see you. So, so welcome. I'm excited to talk about this and I'm curious what's gonna <laughs> happen as well, as many of you said that you were curious. So welcome to those of you that have arrived um, during the practice. And I wanna talk about this topic with integrating freedom Meditation and self-inquiry for a balanced life. Spiritual freedom, the movement toward it is a very natural one. You see that among all cultures. You see the religions that have sprung up or the, the tribal ways of interacting with spirit that happen just naturally as we know as we move through the world that there's something larger than us. There's something beyond what, uh, what we can just experience with our senses and our, our view of the world just being here in this body. So it's an interesting draw that's just naturally there, this movement towards just being who we are which is connected and in, in belonging with the much larger circle of life. So I like to think of it outside of the box of any particular religious tradition. Um, I know many of us may come from, in, in particular, uh, with Menla is associated with the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and then some non-dual traditions, which is uh, where I have come from in Kashmiri Shaivism, in terms of some of the training that I've had but in all of this work, when we're looking at freedom, I, I look at it very simply and directly, so outside of a system. While within systems, we can learn methods and ways to uncover the truth of who we are, but that truth is outside that system. So this movement towards spiritual freedom, I mean, it can come in a lot of different ways. So it can come in big ways and small ways. Um, we, we can want to be free from particular things that kind of plague us or we want to we want to move towards something that we call freedom But we don't know exactly what freedom is Or we've heard someone else say what freedom is and then we're going for that and we're on that seeking train Or we've experienced it deeply already and we want to get back to it because we feel like we've lost it or perhaps we're working to really stabilize our awareness in what we most deeply know to be true. So there's, there's many different kind of ways that we show up in the world moving towards freedom or interacting with what, what, with what is called spiritual freedom. And I'll be asking you what spiritual freedom is. So uh, start thinking or feeling. And so some of the ways that just spiritual freedom kind of happens for people, and I, I will give my own definition of it, but it can come in this moments of grace, you know, where you're just walking down the street and you, you, you suddenly are free of something. It can come through repeated practice that you've learned within a tradition. It can come through insight practice, which is what we'll talk about with meditative self-inquiry. It can come from looking deeply at what's real. Deep freedom can come from looking deeply at what is real. You can be looking at what is real about a belief or a thought or a pattern, and you can, you can go all the way through it to the core 
your core identity. So even something that feels like you're just working with a pattern or a thought can actually take you into deep freedom. And that's one of the neat things with meditative self-inquiry. It can happen when you're around someone who is what, what we would call a teacher or someone who has a, is a little more free than you. Then you get invited into what that could look like for yourself. And uh, one of the really familiar ways for many people, if, you look, if you've read Eckhart Tolle's work, is um, suffer. <laughs> you can suffer hugely, and, and freedom can, fr can come from just going deep into that suffering. But one thing that um, freedom doesn't come from that I've ever seen is avoiding, avoiding what's present. Um, I think that's like a natural way not to be free. It's also something just called resistance. So I'm curious before I get into it a little bit, what is spiritual freedom to you? And um, feel free to go to the chat and type it in. You know, what, it, what is, what does, just kind of like what comes to the top of your head? What's spiritual freedom for me? It's because I'd love for us to all have our voices here. And I want to hear where you're coming from and what your perspective is and what you view as spiritual freedom so that I can give a larger context to what we're talking about here. So if you can go to the chat, it's down at the bottom, the, the um, panel at the bottom, and then just type it into all panelists if it feels okay, or you can just type to me <laughs> um, to say, what is spiritual freedom? For me, what is spiritual freedom? Hmm, just gonna reflect on it and then type in, and you can, you can just type to me if that's easier for you. What is spiritual freedom to me? You know, a part of a creation and connected, open and peaceful. Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. We have conditioned stories. Mm -hmm. Free of conditioned stories, living in the moment, the superpower. I also need to be okay with everything that life brings. Thanks, Fico. Thanks, Anne. Able to leave the past, the conditioning habits, and choose response to current situation that's best for all beings. Beautiful. Surrendering the truth of what is now and present. Thanks, Rick. Hmm. I imagine um, if we, you know, allowed everyone's video on, then we could all just teach this together. <laughs> that's how I view uh, this topic. It's something that's that ha it does happen in community. You know, it feels very individual the freedom, um, but but how it gets expressed is in community, and the actions that come from it are the best for all beings, as you're saying, Joseph, if they're real, authentic actions. Open and accepting of others and their ideas, thoughts, and beliefs. That's huge. That's huge. Thank you, Margaret. Spiritual freedom is open and accepting of others and their ideas, thoughts, and beliefs. Yeah, because we could solidify into our own so much so that we reject the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks you all for sharing. You no, know, for me, it's a, it's a mix of what all you have said. Um, and I'm really curious about like the beauty of spiritual freedom and then also the way that it gets in our own way um, when we're going after it or we're trying to use it to um deal with uncertainty or manage challenge and so it's one of those is a two-edged swords or uh something that you know you have to be really careful with in some ways if if you're if you're moving towards freedom as as we all are as it's really clear and and moving towards integrating freedom both from a place of already being free knowing that deeply and then living into that. 
So for me, that spiritual freedom also is a deep release from, from the core, our core stories, from the way that we hold the world together that's causing suffering, that's othering. And uh, the weight, as it were, of our core misperceptions. And, uh, you know, what, what happens when we have these moments of, of spiritual freedom, then there's, there's ease, there's belonging, there's peace, as you said, Laura. And when it's not feeling to be there, there's, there's kind of a sense of dis-ease that's present that kind of motivates us back towards that, which we both are and are living into. So the freedom is freedom from, and it's also freedom to. So it's freedom from these core stories, but freedom to actually believe the core story, hurt ourselves, and then learn a better way. So there's this really interesting paradox where um, at some point actually um, doesn't even make sense that there isn't such thing as freedom because it's all free. Um, but it certainly doesn't feel like that sometimes. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about, because I think we're all pretty familiar with what spiritual freedom is. Um, for myself, I had, a, mine was like a moment of grace, and then many, many years of, of integrating that grace and that, that clarity that came. And... Um, for me, uh, it was just kind of a moment of, of, of a piercing, knowing all the way to the core of my being, who I am, who I am not. And as a result, that kind of sense of inner connectivity, non-separateness. And then um, from that moment of grace, like a lightning bolt that happened, um, just laying in my bed looking at the wall, then there were just years and years and years and years and years of integrating the freedom, integrating freedom. And for some it's practice, 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 and then freedom. And for some it's freedom and then practice, practice, practice. And we're all somewhere on that spectrum, right? So some of the, some of the ways that I think that we get in our own way as we are on this path of, of, um, understanding what freedom is for ourselves and especially in the non-dual world is we take refuge in the transcendence we um, especially from masculine uh, points of view because a lot of the the spiritual teachers are male and um, my own personal um, opinion is that something around that gives us this idea that the uh, spiritual clarity is the ideal and that the mess of your life is to be just dealt with. <laughs> and that's not the real thing. The real thing is the clear knowing. And if you can just hang out in the clear knowing enough, everything else will take care of itself. And what the more feminine or uh, feminist knowing is that the mess is the stuff. The mess is the path, too. And so some of these ways that we have learned to articulate, like, you know, um, it's just arising, I'm just noticing what's arising, which originally could bring incredible freedom, like, wow, anxiety is arising in my body. That's amazing that I'm able to notice that, be with it, interact with it, engage with it, and not get lost in it. That's so amazing. And then the next time that anxiety arises, I just know that's how to do it. And I distance myself from it while I'm able to also still be with it. And it can turn into like a crystallized way to, to, to be in life. I'm going to be with my experience in a certain way because I am not my experience. It's coming and going within awareness. And then what I can do to... Which, which I think limits, limits me, limits us. What we can do is we can go like, we take refuge in that which is untouched. And um, it's very good to take refuge in that which is untouched and to build those resources in our body and our nervous system of knowing that we're deeply well. 
But when does it start to turn in on itself and get crystallized and we get elitist and we pull back from our experience and we don't work to integrate the mess of our life? Well, the beauty is um, life will show us that, um, that there's parts that are really wanting met and integrated and that this refuge we're taking in ourselves as untouched by this which arises is actually hurting us. So we make this gesture, we take this move back toward, back toward what's present, even fusing with it, feeling it, what's it like, getting in there, and then perhaps somehow in that process there's this freedom that emerges. Another one that um, I feel can, can get in the way, especially in, in the non-dual circles, would be like there's nobody here, like there's no self in the Buddhist frame right? There's nobody here. So, um, so it's all okay. You know, I'm just telling, just letting myself know, well, I'm not anybody anyway, you know, but that's really a mental construct. If you deeply know that, um, it's not something you tell yourself really. Um, because you'd be welcoming what's here because it's part of you. So that's another one to look out for in your experience. And, um, even, even, you know, these like kind of, uh, we prioritize spiritual states like true nature. Like, you know, some part of me wants to go, like, what the F is that? What is true nature? Like, if it's a lived question that's an alive unfolding in my experience that, as Joseph said, allows me to make decisions that are going to have positive impact on all beings, um, then that's true nature. And if it's just this idea I have, this pure awareness that um, were I to live there in a certain way, I would be free of my suffering. You know, it's just not, for me, um, helpful right now for us. I think it's been helpful um, in different ways, just culturally, to get out of our experience and just know that there's something beyond us. And I also, um, I feel like there's another way that, that, that knowing who we are deeply then motivates us to absolutely go for what is it in our lives that's um, shadow and that's um, asking for integration and asking to be brought back to the whole. And while those phrases can be helpful at a time. I feel like this webinar in particular, I just wanna talk about what does it look like to really integrate the psychological conditioning um, in an open, free way without still thinking that there's a certain way I need to be that is in touch with my true nature, et cetera. Like in other words, what if we took all of the lids off on our ideas and the, the names and the, the labels and then just met our experience. So that's really what I'm wanting to get into about what it looks like, you know, to, to have a balanced spiritual life. And there's, there's stages for everything and phases we all go through, bless all of our hearts. I've been there um, in the stage where I, you know, there's nobody here, so it didn't leave me um, unethical but it certainly left me feeling um, distant from the world. And so now, you know, what does it look like to actually move through life in a balanced way using meditation and self-inquiry as kind of guideposts to help deepen our understanding of freedom? And the whole Bodhisattva vow around, vow around you know, I am not free until everyone's free. So it starts within us. You know, I'm not free as an individual until all my parts are free. So that means um, anyone who claims to be enlightened um, is still on a journey. And, and, you know, it's probably not good if they're claiming enlightenment, but even if it is good, they're still on a journey. Even that person is still on a journey. And so what I'm really curious about is how to... Uh, bring more kind of clarity to the journey, the journey part of it, rather than the movement towards freedom. What does it look like to integrate 
the parts of ourselves and meet what's present in order to be more free, more deeply free. So we want to talk about what meditative self-inquiry is. Um, but first, actually, I just want to ask, if you can ask yourself, and if you have a pen and paper, I'd love if you journal a little bit. Um, and the, the question would be, where am I not free? Where am I not free? It might be where am I suffering? But where am I not free? And that really simple question, when sat with, can give us so much information. So if you can, just, just find a pen and paper and begin just writing, where am I not free? See what comes to you. Or just sit and reflect. You know, um, you may have been meditating for 30 years. Um, you may be new to the practice. You may be deeply engaged in the world socially and just look within here where am i not free just with a non-judgmental kindness towards yourself where am i not free And it's so easy to, when we begin to get in touch with where we're not free, to see the ways that we kind of avoid this part that, doesn't, that isn't free. We don't quite have freedom yet, and we, we work to kind of cope around it. Avoid it, or maybe noodle on it, but just never get through to real insight. So the invitation here, when you're feeling a sense of suffering or like this is where I'm not free, is to turn towards that, turn towards that. Now you have to have a first kind of a sense of, uh, of capacity, you know, I'm not going to get overwhelmed by this. But if that's there, turn towards that, you know, because I think so often we turn towards freedom, don't we? I know I do. It's like, oh man, this thing. And then I want to go, how can I be free with this thing? And it's interesting. I'll turn away from the thing towards freedom, which I perceive as elsewhere. But if I turn towards it, perceiving that actually this is an invitation to deeper freedom here, where I'm not free is an invitation to more wholeness. And uh, one of the ways that you can explore this for yourself, so I've written a book on blind spots. <clears throat> and if you go through, there's a lot of practices in that book that's exploring basically how am I not free, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, with my stories, the way I'm holding the world together. How am I not free? But the basic orientation is that of, of really, with kindness, seeing, turning towards, and listening to what's present, what you find. And um, I'd love to see us doing this in community with each other. Here's where I'm not free. What do you see? So that we're doing the work internally and also in community, you know, in small groups or with one trusted friend. So I'm really working on this piece where I'm not free. And it's kind of an invitation. What happens with our, our, our shadow is that these, uh, these banished parts of ourselves that, that, you know, have been driving us unconsciously for years are wanting some attention. They're actually wanting freedom. So it's not our own freedom from the parts of ourselves that are hurting us. It's their freedom that we're working for. So we turn towards and we listen and we engage. 
So it's very relational. Meditative self-inquiry is kind of a context within which you can engage it. So um, I know the Tibetan practices have, have this kind of practice and um, but some, some of the mindfulness practices are just you just like you notice your experience, you be with it, you allow it, and you, you really rest in awareness. Rest is that which notices all that arises. And, and the process of meditative self-inquiry goes, all right, let me get in there with this. Let me get in there. That thing that's arising again and again, I'm going to get in there with it. And, and really ask it some questions and be tender with it and, and find like the gift that it's been trying to give me for 30 years, this piece of anxiety or this depression, this uh, disappointment with life. You know, I'm always disappointed by people. That's a great one to, to really sit and work with and find and mine for the gift. You know, and if we're patient enough with, with meeting the parts of ourselves that, that, that are in shadow and that do want integrated and are inviting us to freedom, a deeper freedom and a wholeness, you know, if we're patient, those can actually be portals all the way into the deepest freedom, you know, I think probably imaginable, which is the freedom from the core identity way of holding the world together separate and each of these kind of beliefs that are stacked on top of that they all hinge on this core the core one so everything that 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 comes that like creates suffering in our own lives is actually an invitation at deeper freedom both within that uh, within that structure that pattern itself and then all the way down all the way in because when when we're when we see through at the deepest core level it, it impacts all of the other layers it doesn't um make us automatically free from everything but it unhooks the core way of identity and seeing the world that that really causes all of the other ones So what I'm really wanting to do is, is get into a practice and some questions. And before that, I, I want to uh, say a story. Um, you know, there's different, different kinds of freedom. So you could look at the freedom, as I had talked about with Eckhart Tolle, or you know, myself looking at the wall, suddenly just kind of waking up, or um, others all throughout history and are on this call having a similar experience and there are also these these um kind of smaller awakenings you could say that when all taken together lead to a core awakening so i was um teaching in in jordan in the middle east um to a group of un uh, humanitarian workers so this was particular a group of Muslims and Christians that were working in the West Bank and um, also in the, the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan. So some of the people were from UNRWA, which was the, the Palestinian um, UN agency that works for Palestinian refugees. Some were from UNHCR with the, the human rights. The, um, some were with, we had some from UNICEF. And there was a gentleman that stood up, and he's a Muslim, living in the settlement that he's working for as a UN staff. So he is, is a refugee and works with the refugees. And after sitting through two days of this Peace on Purpose training I had co-developed, which really brings um, what I'm talking about here to life in, in that context around what does it look like to be with your experience? What does it look like to work with your experience? So in other words, know who you are deeply and then integrate it. And he hadn't said a word the whole two days. I was kind of wondering about him and he stood up and he, he said, I'd like to tell a story. 
And we had just done this piece on, on, on working with and welcoming, you know, emotions. Just providing basic tools for that. And he said, he said, you know, four years ago, my son was born. And I was living in the refugee camp. I went across the border to the hospital with my cousin. My son was born. It was like one of the happiest days of my life. And he said I was driving back over the border and my brakes went out on my car. And he said he felt pure terror that he was going through a checkpoint. There were military people with weapons and he felt this was his last moment. And so he's in the car with his cousin and they're driving through the brakes go out and he just is in a total trauma response like he's dying. And somehow he's able to skid the car over and they were okay. They were let through. They, the people realized they weren't trying to ram through. It was just that the brakes had gone out. And he stood there and he said, what happened that day for the last four years, I haven't connected with my son because I don't feel like I'm really alive. And I have kept any intimacy from my son. And he said, what I've just realized today in doing this work is that it came from that moment. And in realizing that, that's where it comes from and came from, I'm free of it. And I want to go, I want to go home. I want to see my son. I want to be intimate with him, to hug him, to, to let him know, you know, I'm alive. And um, that's an example of just kind of sudden insight where when you're given a tool like meditative self-inquiry, here's how to welcome an emotion. And you really turn and look and see that you've been a little depressed actually for four years and in trauma. It's simply the looking and the seeing and the meeting yourself gives this deep insight that arises that then radically changes your life. So that's the power of the meditative self-inquiry. And it can happen, I've seen it happen hundreds of different ways where when we meet ourselves deeply, especially the parts that you know we've banished, plus our hearts, um, we, we become more free. And, and there is more balance in our lives as, and more willing to, and, and available to be in the world in, in the right way, be in the world in the right way, not from othering, but from true spontaneous action that comes just from being alive, not being blocked by yourself, and then blocked by your ideas of life. So I'd love to open it up here for questions and then do our practice on this. And, and when I do the retreat with men, though, we'll do a lot of yoga nidra, which is a lying down guided meditation practice where, where you're actively looking to work with and meet your emotions and your thoughts and beliefs, and including your sense of self and this deep exploration of all of who you are, which is what meditative self-inquiry is. And the good news is we can learn skills for it. So it doesn't have to be nebulous to us. Um, we can learn skills and then apply those skills in, in really specific directed ways in, the, in which we suffer. Everyone has this like really unique suffering, but suffering's suffering's universal. And uh, freedom from suffering is also universal. It feels pretty similar. So... I'd love to hear if anyone has any reflections from this or a question of something that you were wanting me to address that I didn't. Um, and if so, you can just go down and do the raise hand feature. And um, I think we'll see your hand raised. And then what happens is we'll hear your voice and we'll, um, we'll allow you to talk through the, um, through the function here. You can also post, post them on the chat. Just given everything that you've heard and what you're wanting to hear from this. Is there a question that arises or um, a reflection?
Uh, so I see Ellen with her hand raised. Kelly, so I'll go ahead and unmute her and sure. get her talking. Hey, Ellen. There you go, Ellen. And I think you have to unmute yourself and then we'll hear you. There. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank you. I'm enjoying this to this evening. Um, I just have a question. I notice that once I observe a thought, I change it, or I observe uh, something that I might be wanting to meditate on, I change it. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that about observation and and how mm -hmm. things change once you you examine them. Can you say a little more about um, I change it? What does that look like for you? Well, I, I almost label it. And so then I, I define it and I worry that, you know, I'm not really examining it to the, the right extent because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm almost creating a, a, a little mini narrative about it, changing the story. And, oh. you know, when you observe something, mm -hmm. um, it tends to change. <laughs> yes, it does. It's such a fact on a lot of different levels, even scientifically. <laughs> and, um, and so I don't know if you'd be willing to give an example of a thought. Would it be something like a, a challenging belief or something like a ruminating thought? <clears throat> I would say more of a ruminating thought, you know, that if you, I can't think of anything specifically, I'm sorry, but just that if, if it might be something that is a roadblock just to work through it um, and label it, I just want to be sure that I'm getting to the core of it and not just coming up with a, like, you know, just a, a quick narrative about it and solving it without, you know, I just want to be sure that I'm really looking at it because once you observe it, you label it. Yes. And then you sure. almost imprison it in a, in a way mm -hmm. and you're not really examining it to the right level. Mm -hmm. I guess that's sort of my issue. What a beautiful question. Yeah, because that's really the heart, I think, of meditative self-inquiry where you would notice that you're labeling or limiting perhaps or changing something that's alive mm -hmm. by observing it. And um, there's no problem with that. That's not wrong or bad. The question is, what is, what is present? And what's at the core of it or what's at the heart of it? And by labeling it, do I deepen into what's here? And, and what's being invited? Or do I, do I further distance myself from really being with what's here as an opportunity? And one way to, to uh, circumnavigate that would be to feel it in your body. So there's the thought. They might label, I'm thinking, in that kind of uh, meditative practice. And, and if you didn't label, and you would just feel what it feels like to really be, maybe believe the thought, um, how it feels inhabited in your body, what's here for you in it. Uh, one, one beautiful question that I, it's like a koan, um, it, what is this? What is this? What is this? It's this beautiful way of asking a question the curiosity. So then I would just notice when does labeling or, or kind of labeling, noticing, observing, and then it changes. When does that deepen me into my own felt experience? And when does that um, take me away from what's alive and real? And, and, and then what do both of those feel like going closer to myself, going further away? No right or wrong. It, the, the good and bad news is it'll be, it'll be different in every moment. <laughs> so sometimes it's just the perfect thing to really notice, label the heck out of it, really crystallize it over here and then work with it. And then other times it's best to, to see beneath the assumptions. A little deeper, a little more subtle, and to be with it as a felt sense and see what's, what's here, what's here. What is this? And, and that question, what is this, can be applied to anything from a thought to an emotion to the nature of reality. And so it's a, it's a neat kind of orientation that you can bring. But I would say play with doing both. 
and notice what observing, how it changes things for the quote better, more intimacy with yourself and the quote worse, kind of like um, losing touch with or being lost in a misperception of what's present. All being just the play. So all being, abs you know, every version of that being absolutely allowed. Is there anything else um, with that? No, that's wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Yeah, you really point to what is the heart of, of meditative self-inquiry. And, you know, I think that especially for those of us that have learned tools and practices, it can be so easy to use those on ourselves um, from that, that kind of um, bias we have of knowing what to do and, and what does it mean to actually truly be in the not knowing um, while allowing our own observation to change the heck out of what we're observing. Because that too is natural. And what's that? What's that too? That David Bohm uh, documentary that recently came out, I can't remember what it's called, but it speaks to this uh, phenomenon. So, yeah, this is, it gets subtle when we do this work, I think. And the invitation is to find, like to learn a bunch of different tools and then to find like what spontaneously is needed in any given moment in my life to deepen my understanding of freedom and to integrate my, you know, the, the psychology that's here, the organization that, that, that this being has. And if I can deeply acknowledge that and not weight myself too far towards the freedom side, and, and, I'm, and I'm not pathologizing myself either, trying to make myself this perfect, spiritualized, idealized version of myself. So it's, you can hear it's all this balance of, you know, when, I, when I'm able to really deeply ask the real questions, become more and more free in my, the way I hold the world together, my beliefs, all of this, how does that, how does that like transpose, change me, and then come out into the world? And uh, that's where we're needing ourselves to show up so much right now is the out into the world part. And when we bring ourselves out into the world from a false view of freedom, you know, we can hurt others. I see this so much, oh, bless everyone's hearts. But I see this so much lately, right, in, in, um, in what's going on in our, in our world where people are moving from mm, not even willing to um, identify themselves as, and there's having a conversation with someone who wouldn't even identify himself as a white man because he was so not, not, not able to identify with anything. So that's an example of someone who, um, who isn't, doesn't have the right, the, the best voice for our world right now is we need, we need that man to know he's white so that he can be a part of a group of people that have harmed and so that he can uh, not, not be guilty, but be responsible. And um, I think that that might be the last piece I close on here is uh, ethics and the neat thing about integrating freedom and finding balance in a spiritual life is um, it's an invitation to be responsible. It's the invitation to be deeply ethical that comes from being aligned with who you are. And I think that we could all say that we've seen lots of examples, especially in spiritual communities of teachers that um, don't live this out. And so, you know, the abuses of power, the excuses that the culture has for the teachers. And so one reason why I wanted to speak to this integrating freedom thing is um, 
so many of the, the teachers where they go wrong is they, they, they just feel so free. It's like, well, I'm just, I'm so free I could drink myself to death, you know? And, um, and so that's fine. It, but I think the, the, the deeper invitation, and when I say it's fine, I just, you know, I'm not hugely judging. It just is what it is. But the invitation is there for so much more radical ethical um, responsibility and self-seeing and protection of one's community and um, and seeing one's blind spots and uh, so there's lots of invitations for us here, both ethically, personally, psychologically, as a community. Um, we need ourselves. I, you know, I think. This is what I leave us with, and I'll do a practice, is you know, we need ourselves to show up. We, we're needed. And, yeah, we need ourselves to, to be as clear as we can and, and as loving and kind and inclusive and understanding as possible for what the world is going through. And um, so that could be another invitation, maybe in a journaling practice you do this week, like, how am I needed? How am I needed? We need me. <laughs> we need each other. And it's, it's these kinds of small circles like this that, that we affirm that. I, I love to um, do a closing practice. I have, I have, uh, have inquiry groups that I do, meditative self-inquiry groups that I do. Um, and I'll leave my email on the chat so that you can reach out to me if you're interested and one-on-one -on -one, uh, psycho-spiritual counseling. And I'd love to if, you know, work with anyone or bring you into a group if interested and um, because there's, I've, I've, I've gained some tools over the years, both from the, the IRS, Yoga Nidra, the ways of meeting yourself through all the koshas, all the uh, layers and levels of your body and being in psychology, and then, and then also through mindfulness and the work with the humanitarians and at Google and whatnot. And then um, I've, just, I've just learned some neat ways that are outside of, uh, I would say, a spiritual community or a, um, articulation from a certain religious tradition that I have found like consistently helpful across sectors and people in time. And I'd love to share them with you. So awesome. We have five whole minutes for a practice. And if you'd like to hang in there for this, um, let's do it. Um, so just find yourself comfortable and we'll, let's do a little exploration of freedom. Okay. So just allow your eyes to close if, if that feels right. So sense of perhaps of, of silence, deep silence and stillness. inhabiting or taking your seat in the freedom that is here. Yeah. Seeing through stories, uh, the peace, uh, belonging, ease that arises. Yeah, and the freedom that we are living into. So let this not be a mental exercise, maybe even letting go of thinking per se, intentional thinking, and just a felt sense of the body, just with the eyes closed, or maybe a sense of vast spaciousness of, of love that comes from the heart. 
of rest, simple sense of being here. And can this be enough right now? So inviting in maybe a quality of, of fullness or of wholeness. Just like uh, you put on well-worn clothes, you know, the pair of jeans and the sweatshirt that you're so comfortable in, just climbing into the, the comfortable outfit of, of whole, being whole and free. And maybe making a commitment to yourself to really inquire in the coming weeks, oh, where am I not free? Where am I looking to deepen the freedom that I know? How does it want to get lived out and expressed? And just letting those answers come to you over time, over over these coming weeks. Are you finding wherever your hands are or them coming together, bringing them to your heart, and then gently opening your eyes here? Just a, a deep sense of gratitude and a wish for all parts of ourselves to be free and all beings and to be free. This only happens within our own individual community and this community. So that's the wish and the prayer. And I thank each one of you for being here. So have a lovely evening. archive video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Menla Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of membership, visit tibethouse.us.